Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow. Welcome to Paranormal Yakker. My guest today is British author, co-author, lecturer, broadcaster, and researcher of unidentified flying objects, Philip Mantle. He also heads Flying Disc Press, which publishes books on UFOs. Philip Mantle, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. My pleasure, Stan. Nice to meet you. When did you first become interested, Philip, in exploring the UFO phenomena and uh, take the path you did, which was to research and investigate UFOs? As, as far as I can go back in time, Stan, I always had an interest in all things paranormal. Even, even as a young man, I would prefer to read paranormal books rather than anything else, although the, there wasn't a lot available at that time. I remember in high school, for example, example, I think we had one book in the school library that was of any interest. But uh, I was quite lucky in some respects, because where I used to live, my best friend's grandmother literally lived at the other side of the street. She used to go to the spiritualist church. On occasion, I, I would go with her. Found it fascinating. Didn't necessarily agree with everything, but it, it was interesting. I don't know about in, in the States, but uh, in the, some of the high schools here, after your summer holidays, when you went back to school, the teacher would say, okay, pick people out at random and say, what did you do during the holidays? Some young girl, oh, I, I went riding, you know, we're going on a holiday. What about you, Philip? Oh, I went to the spiritualist church. So reading began it all, I think, Stan. And I remember reading, I, I also was interested in like the space race, astronomy. I remember reading a book on astronomy and it had one chapter in it on UFOs. I can't to this day remember what book it was. Basically dismissing it, but it nonetheless, it got me interested. So after I left high school, I just kept on reading and reading and reading. In the winter of 1978 over into 1979, I worked in what was then West Germany for a few months. Couldn't speak the language Stan, so I asked my mum to send me some books and somehow she managed to get hold of a, a large quantity of paperback UFO books. So I would sit there and read them on an evening because I couldn't understand a word on the German television. So by the time I returned home in May 1979, the, the, you know, I, the bug had got over me, really had. And just by chance, I used to live, uh, I live in, in the north of England, just outside of a city called Leeds. We're about 60 miles from Liverpool, probably a better known city. But Leeds has its own uh, evening newspaper. It's called the Yorkshire Evening Post. And my aunt who lived around the corner brought me a, a copy of it round one evening. And there was a, a, a small advert. I live in the county of West Yorkshire, and it was for the formation of the Yorkshire UFO Society. They were staging a meeting that coming Sunday in the city of Leeds. So I thought, this is for me. So I got on the bus. I didn't drive in those days. Went into Leeds, found this location, and the Yorkshire UFO Society was set up by two brothers, Graham and Mark Birdsell. They put on a presentation. They'd obviously been involved a few years already, and, and that was it, Stan. I, I was well and truly and I never looked back. And that's how I got involved in this, this subject of uh, UFOs. Without Consent, a book you co-authored with Carl uh, Nagetis, uh deals entirely with UFO abductions in the UK. Did you find the descriptions given by the UK abductees and the circumstances in which they were abducted parallel those given by abductees from other countries? Or did you find any anomalies or differences? No, I mean... Um... Uh, Without Consent was the first book that, that, that I, I wrote with my, my colleague, Carl. Carl was a long-standing Fleet Street journalist. What we did find was that there was indeed similarities between the encounters here in the UK, opposed to those in, in the United States, for example. At that time, I was good friends with the late Bud Hopkins. The book came out in 1994, so the research into it was sort of pre-internet days. And I remember one lady who features in the book, she was describing these most bizarre ongoing encounters, Stan. And I would tape record them and I would literally put the headphones on and transcribe the, the conversation and I would mail them.
um, to Bud. There was no email. I, I, you know, the quickest way I could do it was airmail. Bud would read the transcript and would write back to me and suggest that I ask this lady a number of questions because he was writing about things that she was talking about. There is no way that she could have known that. You know, Bud hadn't published any of this work at that point. It was exactly the same type of thing that he later published. It was exactly the same thing. Uh, in your book, Roswell Alien Autopsy, The Truth Behind the Film That Shocked the World, and it did indeed shock the world when it surfaced in 1995. I remember that well. You do a great job of examining the truths and lies behind the alien autopsy film. Uh, to cut to the chase, Philip, what in the film is true, what is not true, and what could be a maybe? There's no if, buts, or maybes in it at all, Stanley. It's all fake. Uh, I mean, the, the alien autopsy film as we know it is actually made up of five separate and different films, and not a lot of people are aware of that. The first piece of film that I have literally just posted online today, although it's been around since day one, is called The Tent Footage. The man in, who owned all this film, Ray Santilli, claims that this dark black and white footage, it goes for about nine or ten minutes, Stan, was the aliens in the desert and they were put in a field tent before being shipped to wherever and they were being examined so that's the first piece of film there's no soundtrack there's too many white coats and there's a creature on us on a on a bench with a white sheet over it and he showed that to me and he gave me a copy of it believe it or not on vhs for what i don't know why i haven't done it before but I, we've recently had it digitized and, and posted it online there are then two separate and different autopsy films most people have seen the, the autopsy and the creatures dissected and it's got a big hole in its leg there is another one same creature same room same personnel however it is completely intact there is no damage to the body there's no holes in the legs there's no bruising then of course we have the so-called debris film that again is in some kind of field tent but is these large eye beams and these panels with the, the six fingers on it and last but not least again which very few people have seen is an interview with the alleged mysterious military cameraman so it's actually five films in total and they're all fake Stan took me a long time investigating it years and years and years and years the man behind it all mainly is a chap called Spiros Malaris he's got many strings to his bow but one of his main ones he's a filmmaker and he's a magician so he knows the art of fooling people and he made the two alien autopsy films one of which we've all seen on television I can say it's all laid out in my book stage by stage, step by step. I wish I could be more positive, but the facts remain. It's a fake. Sorry to say, but there you go. Some years ago, Philip, you were bestowed the honor of being nominated Investigator of the Year by the Yorkshire UFO Society, and you mentioned that earlier about being a member of it. What investigation or investigations were you involved with that led to that nomination? I was just in the right place at the right time, Stan. I joined the Yorkshire UFO UFO Society in, in 1979. For about six months, we used to have monthly meetings. I would go and listen to the presentations, buy more books, of course, and I would soak it up like a sponge. In the north of the county, in North Yorkshire, we have a, an area called the Yorkshire Dales National Park, beautiful part of the world. And for whatever reason, some of, some of the locations in and around the market town of Skipton in the Yorkshire Dales started having a lot of sightings. This is a sparsely populated place once you get out of the town, Stan, beautiful moors, uh, not so beautiful when it's raining, of course. <laughs> But areas in and around there had a lot of sightings and they managed to find their way back to us. And when I say sightings, I mean sightings of just about everything you can think of. Strange lights, strange craft, you know, encounters, paranormal activity. Uh, and we had a, um, a you know, a, a colleague who, who lived in that area who became a focal point for it and he would pass things on to us. It was literally the right place at the right time. I, I'd become interested. I'd been taught the ropes, the basics of investigation by Graham and Mark, uh, and, and Mark or Graham used to accompany us at times, or, or all three of us would go, but there were there were times, literally, Stan, that we couldn't cope. We had that many sightings. The society grew as, as a result, so we had more people volunteering their time, of course. On and on it went, you know, for, for years, literally, for years. That's how I became nominated for the Investigator of the Year, simply because I, we had such a volume of, of cases coming our way that I was just available. You 
have researched and written extensively about UFO sightings in Russia and the other countries that were once part of the former Soviet Union. This includes what's referred to as Russia's Roswell incident. Could you elaborate on that incident? In 1986, there's a place called uh, Dalnogorsk in Russia. It has a mountain there, which is uh, on the map at that time, was simply known as Height 611. That was, that was the name of the, of the mountain. It was an industrial town, was Dalnogorsk. No airs and graces, no fancy palaces or anything like that. And in 1986, something came over the town and impacted into the hillside above, into Height 611. Sometimes it will be known as Dalnogorsk, other times it will be known as Height 611. They are the same thing. So local residents, because of its location, were managed to get to the site before the Soviet authorities. And they found debris, almost like a filament. They found these small balls of material. The damage and the impact site were there. They photographed it and they managed to secret some of this material away before the Soviet military became involved. What's fascinating, Stan, before I forget, the se- we're talking about the same incident. In your country, in Albuquerque, I believe it was last year, in Albuquerque, you have the Atomic Bomb Museum. And one of these pieces from the Dalnagos crash was on display at the Atomic Bomb Museum in Albuquerque. Don't ha- ask me how or, or why. I wrote to them, but it was during the pandemic, so my, my, my letter was, it's probably still waiting to be answered gathering dust. Some of this debris is still around. Of course, once the, the you know the, the Berlin Wall went down and it was the end of the Soviet Union, it became easier to uh, discuss things with our colleagues in that part of the world. My co-author is Paul Stonehill, who lives in California, but Paul is originally from the Ukraine. So not only does he speak the language, you can read and write it as well. So that between us, we've managed to solicit a lot of material from what was the former Soviet Soviet Union, and we're still at it to this very day, Dan. Uh, Stan, sorry, but, you know, it, it's a fascinating case. It really is. In Russia's USO secrets, unidentified submersible objects in Russian and international waters, a book that you wrote with Paul Stonehill, who you just mentioned, uh, you reveal strange encounters by the Soviet and Russian Navy with things that are not supposed to exist. Can you share some of those things with the uh, paranormal Yakker audience? Audience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure your audience will know that back in during the Second World War, both Allied and Axis um, aircrew reported Foo Fighters. They both thought it was the enemy. It was so. It was only at the end of the war that we found out that it wasn't the enemy on either side. No one had an explanation for these things. Well, similar things happened in international waters between primarily the United States and the Soviet military. They were picking up these strange detections in the war and strange noises. So the Soviets thought this is something new that the Americans have invented. So we, we, you know, we better keep a close eye on it. And of course, unbeknown to them, the American sub- submariners thought this is something the Soviet Union has invented. We better keep a close eye on it. So it was almost like full fighters, but underwater. And this went on for many years. And of course, it was only with the dissolving of the Berlin Wall that they realized that it, neither side had, had invented this, these objects, whatever they were and the strange noises that were picked up. But they weren't just in the sea as well. In in Russia, there is a place called Lake Baikal. By volume, it is the largest freshwater lake in the world. Things have been seen in the lake. Strange lights, strange noises. They go back centuries, the sightings in this area stand. Strange creatures as well that have been encountered there. And the whole region has its own mythology and folklore as a result of these encounters. And that's something that nowadays has come to the forefront of research with the Navy Tic Tac videos being out at sea, some claiming they started underwater, of course, but we've been writing about it for a number of years now. It's become in vogue now as, as the subject of, of USOs. So it's a, it's a fascinating area, Stan, it really is. From the research you've conducted, Philip, uh, have you been able to trace how far back in history various peoples have claimed that alien beings visited them and provided them with advanced technology? Technologies and even procreated with them. We, we'd probably put that under the umbrella of the ancient astronaut theory. I mean, some of my colleagues are, are now coming to the conclusion or opinion, if you like, that whatever UFOs are, that they've always been here. You know, they've always been beside us. Of course, Eric von Daniken, you know, probably the grandfather of the ancient astronaut theory, claims that the gods are, are astronauts from other 
other worlds and that they have uh, assisted mankind, if you like, with little nudges, to, you know, keep us going in the right direction down the, the millennia and not just decades. I mean, we, we talk about flying saucers beginning in 1947 with Kenneth Arnold. Well, the phrase flying saucer went into popular culture then. But if you go back to the records, Stan, you can find UFO sightings decade after decade after decade. And they were interpreted in, in the technology of the times, of course. It's, it's, it's an interesting idea that whatever UFOs may or may not be, in, in recent years, we've learned more about the universe and how our universe, how big it is. The possibility of, of beings coming from a distant point or in linear travel, you know, moving from A to B is, is probably out of the question. But maybe they did come. That was, you know, eons ago. And, and rather than go home again, because it's such a long way, they thought maybe we'll stay here. And, you know, maybe we're something of, we're part of something much larger. There is another sort of spin-off from that, Stan. People claim that we are originated on Mars because Mars once had liquid water on it. And we know on Earth where you find water, there's life. And meteorites from Mars found its way to Earth. Not if you remember in, in President Clinton's term in office, he presented a, um, a piece of rock that had come from Mars and he almost confirmed that there was life in it. It was fo fossilized life and a micro fossil, you know, there are bacteria. But bacteria is life irrespective. So there's lots of ways of looking at that. But certainly the ancient astronaut theory has, has grown over the last few years and the interest in it, it, it looks like it's it's continuing to do so. We shall see, Stan. In your opinion, Philip, do you have a theory or want to speculate as to why alien beings have and are visiting our planet and why, especially in recent years, are making their presence more and more known to us? When I, when I first started in this subject, I was very naive, Stan. I thought, I'll write a few letters and interview a few people and I'll, I'll, I'll know the answers within no time. That wasn't to be. But there have been times in my life where I thought, I, I know what's going on here. And I think I finally got an angle on it and then something would happen and that would knock it all into touch. You know, it, it, it wouldn't be right. What is interesting, I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, but um, I published two books by a Romanian. It's Dr. Dan Farkas. The first one was simple, UFOs over Romania. It was like a potted history of, of UFO sightings in, in Romania. Fascinating book. Dan then went on to write another book and it's it, it's not a huge great tome. It's called Hyper Civilizations. Dan's theory in this is that, yes, we are being visited by beings from another world. However, on the evolutionary scale, they're not a few thousand years in advance of us, Stan, possibly millions or tens of millions of years. Therefore, we as a species, mankind, simply are not capable of understanding them. We're, we're, we're too dumb, you know. And it, it gives the analogy, if you if you take a television set or a flat screen and put it in an ant's nest, the ants will know it's there. They'll be able to crawl all over it and feel it. Uh, the soldier ants may even attack it. And the, if they could get, get in the back of it, they'll find something entirely different. But never in a zillion years will they be able to figure out where it came from, what its purpose is, and how it was made, who made it. The same kind of question we're asking about the UFO phenomenon. I think we can all be positive that the phenomenon is real. It does exist. But what lies behind it, perhaps we're, we're not clever enough yet on the evolutionary scale to figure it out. And that's why sometimes when we see UFOs and they appear to be doing things that are stupid, I mean, but they're not stupid. It's just that we can't understand it. We try and think about it in the only way we can as human beings. And of course, we, we haven't reached the, the, the stage yet where we can understand what's happening. So I'm not saying Dr. Farkas is right or wrong. All I'm saying is it made me think. It made me think again. So I, I keep an open mind on that. But that's something I would recommend your listeners think about. When the day comes, Philip, and for me personally, I hope it's sooner rather than later that alien beings come out in full force and make themselves known to us loud and clear uh, and no government agency that have its own agenda can cover it up. How do you think the various governments, military, ordinary citizens will react? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a question I've been asked a number of times. I would say more by journalists than by UFO researchers. Um, let's assume disclosures happened yesterday, last week, but it's recently happened. 
doesn't alter the fact that I still got to pay my electricity bill. You know, I've got to, I still have to walk my dog. If I, if I had a, a, a daytime job, a proper job, I'd still have to go to work in the morning. Still got to cook my dinner tonight. And, and the, we have to remember there's parts of the world, Stan, that are not linked to the West. They don't have cell phones and computers. And they don't even have electricity. And they would not know anything about it whatsoever. So their life would go on just the same as it has done for, for centuries. And then, the, you know, the way the world is today and the world that we live in, certainly in the West, depending on which TV channel you watch. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I can see you smiling. You would say, yes, I believe it. Or no, it was shown on that channel. That's nonsense. You know, it's it's disinformation or fake news. And, and we'd have all that. It would depend on you as an individual rather than us as a race and on how you accepted it. Would the financial institutions crash? I doubt it. I'm sure they'd find a way of making money out of it somewhere along the line, Stan. Nothing wrong with that. Would the religious institutions collapse? No, because as far as they're concerned, God created the heavens and earth. If beings are coming from some other, some other place, well, he made them anyway. He just never thought to tell us about it. Or if you believe in evolution, then they will have evolved in a similar manner to the way mankind has, and th but they're just more advanced than us. You know, they evolved earlier. So it, it would depend on you as an individual rather than the, how we would collectively look at this. But I don't think things would change that much, to be honest. As stated in my intro, you have your own publishing company, Flying Disc Press, and I know you're excited about a new book you have out by Don Schmidt and Tom Carey titled Touched by Roswell, Crash Encounters of the Rich and Famous. I wish you success with it and look forward to interviewing the authors on a future date. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to purchase Touched by Roswell or learn about other books your company publishes, what is your contact information? Yeah, well, all, all our books are, are, of course, on Amazon. Um, but um, I have a little blog and it's simply flying this press. Dot com disc spelt with a K in the old fashioned way. So flying dispress.com. I'm found there. All the books are listed on there on Facebook, flying dispress, Philip Mantle. You'll find me easily. And also on, on Twitter. I use that on occasionally. So you'll find me at philip.mantle. So I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, easily located, Stan. You know, I don't hide away. Otherwise, I'd never sell any books. <laughs> Philip Mantle, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. It was wonderful yakking with you. Thank you. My pleasure, Stan. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. To be sure you don't miss any interviews on my free YouTube channel, all you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen.